Welcome to Behind the Black Belt, a podcast about the people and black belts of BJJ. Welcome to Behind the Black Belt. I'm your host, Rich, and my guest today is fourth degree BJJ black belt Elvis Sinisek. Now, also known as the king of rock and rumble, Elvis is a true pioneer of grappling and mixed martial arts in Australia. Not only is Elvis Australia's first UFC fighter, but he's also the first Australian to fight for a UFC world title. And as an MMA fighter, Elvis has fought absolute legends of the sport, including Frank Shamrock, Tito Ortiz, Forrest Griffin, and Michael Bisbing, just to name a few. And also, Elvis was the first Australian to actually compete at the ADCC. And interestingly, he is the first person in ADCC history to win with a heel hook submission. How times have changed. Elvis established one of Australia's flagship MMA and BJJ schools, Sinisic Parosh Martial Arts, with his longtime training partner, Anthony Parosh. And he is now the chief instructor and director at King's Academy of Martial Arts in Western Sydney. Elvis Inisic, I am extremely excited. Thank you and welcome to Behind the Black Belt. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be the king. Uh, always got to throw <laughs> that uh, yes. call sign in there. Um, it's a pleasure to be on here. Um, as, you can, as you've just said, I've been in the sport uh, for a very long time. Um, I'm a pioneer, not by any design, just by circumstance. That's when I happened to get into um, this sport and yeah. industry, and it's been a fantastic journey. And hopefully, the listeners will learn a lot more about it as we continue on. Oh, I'm so much looking forward to it. I'm a very, very long time fan, Elvis. So, excuse me if I geek out and, and really get into it because I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. All right. So, we've got so much to cover. Um, so, why don't you kick us off, Elvis? Start off with where you were born and where were you raised? So I was uh, born in Canberra, Australia, the ACT, uh, the nation's capital. Um, I lived there for most of my junior life. Um, Went to school in Canberra. Um, That's where I discovered martial arts. I kind of, yeah, just lived a a normal life in in Canberra. Yeah, and which part of Canberra in particular? So I started uh, pretty much uh, uh, what we call northern, the northern Canberra, the Belconnen end. I started oh, yeah. in Higgins and then moved to Everett, and, but I've always lived up the, the north side uh, yeah. of Canberra. Okay. Or, and my mum actually still lives there at the moment. Fantastic. And a real sort of suburban upbringing in Canberra? Yeah, very much suburban. Um, back in the old days when milk bottles were delivered to houses, kids rode bikes <laughs> on the streets. Um, we were that um, traditional wog family. We had a garden in the backyard. We had a, a chook shed um, and obviously dogs and all that sort of stuff. So it was very much um, outdoors. So I used yeah. to play, lit, quite literally playing the dirt and all that sort of stuff, which um, sadly I don't think enough kids do nowadays, but I plan to make sure mine does. Awesome. Awesome. And tell us about your parents. What brought them to Canberra? Um, I couldn't tell you what brought them. Uh, oh, so they, they came from Croatia and they came from a you know, troubled era. Um, my father escaped across the border and ended up in a refugee camp in Italy. So he spent a couple of months there. He was planning to go to Canada where he had uh, some relatives. And then a couple of months into it, like it's obviously terrible living conditions. Um, he decided Oh, sorry, he didn't decide. Uh, they came out and said, look, we've got a ship going to to, Can- uh, to Australia. Who wow. wants to go to Australia? And he's like, I don't want to be here anymore. He's got, he had to wait in like another three months for the ship that goes to Canada. Um, he had a cousin in Canberra uh, in Australia, and he just went, you know what? I'm, I'm just, I'll just go to Australia first, and, and if that doesn't work, then I'll, I'll head over to, to Canada afterwards. He just wanted to get out of there. Yeah. Ended up coming down here. Because uh, he had his cousin in Canberra, that's that was the city he ended up choosing. Uh, and then from there, he wrote my mother back home. Um, you know, they back in the days when you actually had to write letters. Um, <laughs> yep. You know, even phone calls weren't really possible, and definitely no internet or FaceTime or anything like that. So he was writing letters to her, and then he called her over. So she decided to come over, and well, they made little baby Elvis, and here I am. 
Fantastic. Fantastic. And I mean, th through some hardships for your parents to get um, to, to live in Australia, do, do you remember any of that as growing up as a child or was it just a real new chapter for, for them once they were in Australia? Um, no, look, I, obviously as a child, you see what's going on and, you know, mm. I could see the difficulties. Um, my family really did try to integrate into society. Um, because at home we ha we spoke, even though I learned Croatian initially, um, you know they, they they shared the culture with me. We spoke a lot more English at home because my parents wanted to be able to speak to other people and communicate. And so you know we spoke spoke a lot of English. And then when I went to school and learned to read and write, I used to help my parents try and um, read and write. And it's funny because um, that they write mnemonically, so they spell out sounds. So when they write it. You've actually got to um, read it phonetically to be able to understand what my mum was yeah, writing. Yeah, yeah. It's quite funny because a lot of the, the rules that, you know, that come with the English language, I before E except after C and things like that, just, it didn't click. But mm. at least um, they, they got the hang of the alphabet and writing. They were able to communicate. So, yeah, look, it, it was a difficult time. Um, my father was a labourer. Um, all his life, my mother used to go out in the evenings and clean. So when dad was working, mum was home. And when mum was working, dad was home. And we always had that sort of um, lifestyle. Our parents, obviously, like most most parents, want to give their children more um, than what they have, and they wanted to make sure that um, you know we got all the schooling. They were super proud of me because I think I was the first person in our family to go to university and then wow. to graduate from university. So, you know, where I am today is, you know, a lot of thanks to them. If they hadn't put in the hard work, if they hadn't instilled that worth, ec worth ethic in myself yeah. um, and been willing to, to live a hard life of hardship so that I didn't later on, um, you know, things might be very different. So, you know, I love my parents and I love what they've done for me. And as I say, adver adversity makes strong, strong men. So, yeah. Uh, I, I've thankfully um, gained from their adversity. Absolutely. Sounds like just absolute hard work, such humble beginnings, and, and you're the product of that. You know, you're something that, that you must be absolutely proud of. Um, I must ask Elvis, so the name, how, how, did, how did you come to be named Elvis? Is there a story behind it or just quite or Look, or just it's just very one simple? of those horrible coincidences in life. Um, my mother had a friend back home in Croatia who had a son whose name was similar to Elvis. Um, I, I think it's a relative, it's not an uncommon name in Croatia, Elvis. Okay. okay. So it's not, it's not a common name, but it's not uncommon. So I've met a few other Elvises. Um, so I just kind of, she liked the name and then, you know, I got that name and obviously, you know, linked with the king. Yeah. Um, I got ripped for most of my life through school <laughs> about it. And that's kind of why I got into martial arts, but we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. Journey. Um, but it's kind of funny because my, my brother and sister are Susie and Paul. So it's like Elvis. <laughs> and then, yeah, we'll just go Susie and Paul, you know, keep it simple for the rest of them. Only yeah. I have to suffer. Oh, that's great. That's great. Because I bet you everyone assumes your mum and dad were just absolute Elvis Presley fans and, and you were the, the, the homage to this artist. But no, it's, it's a quite a common name. Well, it's funny. Yeah, no, they had um, no idea when they named me who it was. But obviously, once they found out, you know, they bought the, a couple of the albums and things like that, just so they can say, hey, look, we've got something with our son's name on it. That's so, so cool. That's great. That's great. So what kind of kid were you, Elvis? Were you, uh, were you a great academic kid? Were you a bit of a troublemaker? How would you describe yourself? I was definitely the, the nerdy child. I was um, uh, academically inclined. I, I did well at school. Um, you know, I played the Dungeons and Dragons and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't, uh, I think I, I was quite well gifted with it. And sometimes as a child, um, I took advantage of that. So I used to coast through some of my classes and stuff and didn't always put in the effort that I could have academically. Mm. It wasn't until I realized the gifts that I had that I started really um, working harder. You know, I, I enjoyed playing sport. I enjoyed intellectual pursuits. As I said, you know, I like fantasy role-playing games. Uh, played a little bit of video games. Never really got into it the way a lot of people in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu community do. Yeah. Um, 
pretty much just a, a normal child, I think a relatively well well balanced. Um, again, with my name and uh, being a little bit more intellectual, I did get picked on in school a little bit. Yeah. Again, that kind of led on to uh, discovering the martial arts. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, let's talk, talk, tell, talk us through how you then go on to discover the martial arts as a kid. So as mentioned, you know, uh, got picked on a little bit, you, you know, one, it's a couple of things, you know, I'm a little bit nerdy. I uh, was a wog, a wog as they would call it back in the day. Yeah. Um, I had that name Elvis, which, you know, just leads to Elvis the pelvis and nicknames and making fun of you. And um, I kind of discovered Bruce Lee. So, you know, in the movies and then I started buying VHS tapes. So that gives away uh, how old I am. And that was back in the day where Beta and VHS used to fight off. Wow. Um, at our household, the VHS tapes won, thankfully. Um, <laughs> So I discovered Bruce Lee and I got all these tapes. And I wanted to get into the martial arts. And um, while I was in primary school, I think it was about year two, um, the school started a judo program. Now hmm. it wasn't what I wanted with punching and kicking, but it was martial arts. So, you know, I jumped in. Who, who would have foretold years later that grappling is where I was actually supposed to be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I got into the judo. Um, and it was great for my parents because it was unlike uh, the football. So I wanted to play football as well. But because of the the times of the class, uh, the sport was generally straight after school. And my parents weren't able to uh, pick me up and drop me off because of the, the way my dad would come home. And then my mum would have to go to work. So it was a little bit more difficult to to do those sports. But the judo started a, a little bit out. It started in the evening because it was indoors. So there was enough time for my dad to come home, mum and dad do the swap over and then drive the kids down to judo in the evening. So it kind of fit in with their schedule. And I wanted to do the martial arts, so it kind of uh, worked well. I was a very lanky kid uh, as well. Um, so the, the throwing never really um, melded with me, but once it hit the ground, I, I felt a, a, an affinity to grappling. I always preferred the grappling or the nawaza aspect of, of the judo. Um, when I was training there and that would later on pay dividends when I discovered um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So I did that for a few years until um, I went to high school. And then when I got to high school, I wanted to get into um, more striking martial arts. And I kind of got to that age where I got a driver's license, mm. you know, 16 and years and nine months, I got my L's and then 17, um, I was driving. So my parents, you know, gave me the car. So because of that, now I didn't have to just uh, go to school to do the martial arts. I could find an, an academy. So I'd, I'd, I actually picked a Taekwondo school. Okay. Um, and that it was, I was looking for Kung Fu, but there was no Kung Fu around. And the ad was Korean Kung Fu. And I'm like, well, that's close enough to me. And as a child, I didn't know any better. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I moved in, I, I started doing the um, the Taekwondo did that for quite a few years, got my black, black belt in Taekwondo and then uh, ended up moving uh, to university. When I hit uni, I kind of got a little bit busy and I kind of stopped um, all my martial arts training. Mm -hmm. um, what we started doing at uni was uh, with a group of friends is every, every month we would play a different sport. Mm. So we you know, pick a sport. Um, you know, it might be tennis. So for a month we played tennis and then for another month we played soccer and then another month, we just wanted to keep it interesting and mix yeah. it up. And, and you know, then we discovered badminton. We got into that for a little while, which was a bit of fun. And then that led to volleyball because we're trying to do all sorts of different sports, not just stick to your, your, you know, we'd done all the tennis and cricket and running and all that and the football and soccer. And we discovered volleyball and I kind of, really took to volleyball. I was a tall, lanky kid, so um, it kind of fit my build very well. Um, required a lot of jumping. I had a good um, vertical leap. So mm. I started in the um, in a social league just for fun. I was only supposed to do it for a couple of months, but one of the uh, state league coaches was um, scouting in the, the social league, saw me there, goes, look, you've got to come down and try it out. So, well, I ended up getting into the state league uh, indoor volleyball. And obviously, wow. that I discovered uh, beach volleyball. So, we started traveling up to Sydney to play beach volleyball while I was going through um, university. And I, uh, and then my affinity for volleyball kind of transitioned a little bit to beach because just because it was a little bit newer, it was a lot more fun. 
I got to hang out on the beach, lovely girls in bikinis, it was good weather, <laughs> um, plenty of vitamin D, uh, all the good things in life. So kind of kept going through that until I eventually graduated um, from university. Yeah. Which took me to uh, my first job, which was um, uh, ADAB, which became AusAid, which was just a government department which gave okay. aid uh, overseas. And in there, I actually, uh, in the, I was in the IT department and there was a, an old school friend actually from primary school from back when I was doing uh, judo and he was doing uh, Kyokushin karate and he's like, oh, um, you've got to check this out. And he pulled hmm. out the VHS tape, UFC 2. I had no idea what it meant. And I, I watched it and I was absolutely hooked. This little skinny Brazilian dude um, choking out. Um, all the big people, I'm like, oh, I want to do this jiu-jitsu. And then I discovered the Blitz magazine and John Will's journey overseas. We went to Indonesia to do Salat, went to India to wrestling peaks, and he discovered first the greatest races and then the Machados. Mm. So I started doing more investigating. I couldn't find any jiu-jitsu schools in Canberra. They just didn't exist. Um, back in that time, it was in the, like the, the mid-90s. Like I graduated in... Um, so I was in uni, uh, graduated in uh, so 98, around 2000 or something like that. Okay. And I, but I found a Jun fan school. I'm like, oh, Bruce Lee. And they, and they, they had stick fighting, Muay Thai and uh, jiu-jitsu grappling. Now, it was obviously the hybridized um, Jun fan, Jeet Kune Do, Do, Do style grappling. But it was enough to get me back into training. Um, I got into there, started competing in the all styles competition because that's all that I had in Canberra was point fighting. Yeah, um, I actually became the state champion in that as well. Um, but then in my journey going to to Sydney, I kind of fell in love with the the, the um, beach volleyball, so I wanted to do it more. I ended up meeting a, a lovely young lady up there, so we started dating and. The distancing wasn't working very well. So I started looking for work in, in uh, Sydney, mm. found a job in Microsoft. So I just made sense, ended up moving to Sydney initially. Um, where I was, I was training. I started training in a, a Kali school because that was all that was close by. And I did my research, discovered Anthony Lange up in Manly. And he was teaching um, shoot fighting, which was uh, the, the Will Machado, um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu along with, you know, some Muay Thai and grappling and um, wrestling and that sort of stuff. So I went, well, you know, that's what I want. They've got the Machado jiu-jitsu, awesome. which I've learned about through Blitz magazine and John Will. And, you know, he was the, the pioneer for um, Australian uh, jiu-jitsu. He brought it over here, introduced it. So it made sense to kind of jump on, jump on board, started training there and then, you know, pretty much the rest is um, where we are today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's awesome. So, so you, when you were leaving high school, you went to university, what did you actually do at uni? So um, when I was in um, pro, uh, high school, I wasn't really sure what I, I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, I did have an affinity to, for, with computers. I kind of enjoyed it because I had quite a, I have a very structured analytical approach to things and, okay. and computing just kind of fit that, that kind of framework. Um, I was very interested in so my, so my two interests were botany. I, I really enjoyed plants. Really? Um, I have a, like, I'm even now I'm a gardener. That's one of the ways I enjoy myself. I just had this thing. I was looking at either doing a botany course uh, or an IT course. And um, when I went from, um, primary school to no sorry from high school to college i was looking for a college that had a botany course i couldn't find one but i found um the dixon college had an agriculture course mm. and an it course so i'm like they're the two things i kind of enjoy so let's let's do that so i jumped in and um the agriculture course was quite fun but it was more hands-on planting and building stuff and doing that and and even though there was a plant element, it wasn't quite the the botany's kind of science uh, approach because I did enjoy chemistry and that sort of stuff in, in high school. So, whereas the IT, the, the computer course, 
kind of captured me and I was, um, Interestingly enough, we were using MacBooks, uh, not MacBooks, Mac computers because yeah, the, yeah. the DOS-based systems weren't um, good enough. So I kind of got into computers, enjoyed that a lot more. Um, and then when it came time to, to kind of go to uni, even though I still kind of enjoyed plants, um, the agriculture course didn't really ignite the passion the way I kind of enjoyed computing sure. and I really didn't know what I wanted to do and I was good at computers. So it just made sense to kind of um, go into computing. So I ended up going to university doing a, the yeah. IT course there. Interestingly enough, um, about a year into um, my degree, I started delving into teaching. I can't even remember how I did it, but I started doing some teaching and helping people. I really had this affinity for teaching and I, I, I wanted to change my degree from an IT degree to a sports coaching degree. Huh, okay. But my parents talked me out of it. They said, look, you've, you've started your degree, finish it. Once you finish, then you can do your, your, your coaching degree. And I went, oh, okay. But if any, as anyone who's done university will tell you, once you get out, you don't want to go back in as much as it is a lot of fun. Once you've got a job, you've got an income, you don't have to do homework. Life changes a little bit. So once I got out, I never really went back to do that sports coaching degree that, yeah. I, that I really wanted. But what happened was, is when I got into IT, I actually got into su the support side. So helping people. Um, and through that, I actually, I've actually had a couple of companies try and lure me away because they would introduce their pro there was a product which is still out now and it's a voice activation software called dragon dictate mm. now uh i think it was acer back in canberra in the day had the rights to the dragon dictate and they introduced it to our department um in the government so we had to, they had to train some people up and i was the one that just uh picked it up really well so they made me the trainer's trainer. So I had to train not only the um, people how to use it, but train the other trainers how to teach it and that. So, and then Ace is like, oh, wow, you're doing a really good job. So they asked me to help out with some uh, conferences and functions that they had in Canberra to help promote the product. They got me in and I started, which is really funny because when I was in high school and um, even at uni, I had this absolute fear of getting up in front of, um crowds like i had stage fright i couldn't get up i was tongue-tied when i had to do presentations in class I, I couldn't speak well but for some reason with this the it because i just felt so comfortable with it i could just pull someone up and talk to them and explain it and break it down yeah, yeah, yeah. And it didn't really seem like i was doing what i i was afraid to do and and then yeah. that kind of helped me later on in my fight career so they tried to uh, get me on board and they almost lured me out. I was ready to, to um, jump ship and <laughs> when Asa went into financial difficulty and I'm like, well, okay. So I took a step back. Um, that didn't eventuate. Ended up going to uh, Sydney. Actually joined, uh, got employed by Microsoft again because yeah. um, when I was in my government, I had a couple of different government departments. I'd supported Lotus Suite and Microsoft Suite. So I was one of the few people that had the ability to support two product platforms. And right. Microsoft was really trying to lure Lotus customers over to Microsoft, but none of their um, technicians knew how Lotus worked enough to be able to show them how to do what they needed to do in Microsoft, whereas I knew both backwards. Yeah. So I got that job and they, they almost, same thing, they almost got me into a, a, a teaching role, but um it was actually less money than the support role at the time so i, I didn't take it and then i ended up going moving to a couple of different because microsoft didn't pay you what you were worth because the quality of having microsoft on your resume they felt was more than right um, worth All right it. okay um so i didn't i only ended up staying with them for about i think three to four months um and then i got an offer at Qantas again because they had both lotus and microsoft and then from Qantas i went to Colonial State Bank, and then I ended up um, Coopers and Librand, which yeah. is what you see. So, and I've worked a lot of big companies through the years. But it's quite interesting that I had this affinity for teaching, and I wish I wanted to, to teach and share and help people. So, 
when it kind of came time to, to open up a gym, I already knew that's what I wanted to do. I'd been kind of doing it and being dragged that way for many years. It just, the opportunity never really kind of presented itself the way that was suitable for me. And then when the opportunity came, I, I pretty much jumped in both feet. Yeah, absolutely. I just, I, I love it. You had this crossroad where, where you, I don't think you can get more opposite Elvis, where it's botany or IT. It's like yeah, no. so no, opposite ends of the spectrum. And I mean, you know, late nineties, early two thousands, it, it seems one has a extreme earning potential and one, one, one maybe well, yeah, a passion. I'm lucky. I probably wouldn't have, I probably would have turned into a science nerd and never got into martial arts <laughs> yeah. if I had gone the botany way. And, um, yeah. But yeah, look, uh, IT was a new and evolving industry. Absolutely. It kind of moved since um, back then, as I said, it, it fit my structured view of the world and systems yeah. and uh, all that all that sort of approach to things made sense to me. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, and I had a, a much better career potential. Um, yeah, yeah. looking forward so yeah when it came to going to university it, it kind of made sense it's kind of funny though because also at university um one of the in my first semester one of the courses i took up was actually japanese huh. and that was more to do with my interest in um the martial arts and where martial arts originate you know china japan and all that yeah. sort of stuff so uh, i i wanted to do the, the Japanese course and I did it for an entire semester and I have to say learning language is one of the most difficult things and people that have multiple languages I give them so much respect because yeah. after doing that for like only six months uh, six months or no maybe I, no the first six months I got through okay the second six months were killing me yeah um, particularly with, with Japanese where their structure is different you know we I go to work whereas they go, say I work go and you yeah. know, so the different structure, having the three um, alphabets, um, kanji, katakana, hiragana, the, the three different ones, and uh, knowing that katakana was for English words and hiragana was for Japanese words, and then having kanji, which is single characters, which represents an entire word. And there are so many characters that not even any of the Japanese will know all the, the, the kanji. And, um, and then I picked up, I, I picked up, the the speaking quite well um i just struggled with with the writing and the um reading uh so i can still say watashi wa terebi wa mimas you know i like to watch i watch tv <laughs> that's all you need what else do you need to say in japan uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, awesome awesome all right uh, well but it, it also paid dividends when i ended up going to japan for some yeah, of my yeah, yeah. as well and i actually um made the effort and one of the um tours uh, the guides that, that came over was really um very happy that i was making an effort to speak japanese with him and i was learning the language because he goes most of the um gaijin um didn't really make um uh, much of an effort to learn the um the language they they made them speak english to them whereas i was trying to like i was trying to teach them english and have them teach me japanese and stuff so it was a kind of a uh, fun time as well but yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, i ended up ha having to drop out of japanese because at the end of my second semester my professor comes up to me and goes look you're borderline you're probably going to fail the course he goes if you're planning to continue i'm going to have to fail you because wow. just the standard is not high enough he goes but if you're happy to leave it at that I'm happy to give you a provisional pass on the, on the course and uh, we'll leave it at that. And I just went, you know what? Let's just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks. That, 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 that's a bit of a golden ticket, isn't it? So, all right, yeah, thanks, so mate. I didn't fail, so I'm happy with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm happy not to continue because to continue, I would have had to go back and do it all over again. And I felt like I'd picked up enough to be able to, to be useful to speak when I went to Japan, which uh, yeah, ended up being enough. Um, and then I ended up switching more, focusing on the IT, going into a, a double IT degree and then having a sub degree in office works and office management sort of thing, um, which again pays dividends now with my gym and everything like that. That's so cool. That's so cool. I mean, talk about breaking a stereotype, you know, we're now going to switch over to MMA and BJJ, not, not the start to this podcast. I thought we were going to have, you know, <laughs> IT and botany and, and, and volleyball. It's, um, wow. That's, that's super, super interesting. 
All right. So pick us up, Elvis. You are so you you, you go and start training with Anthony Lang, and you're you're doing this martial arts. Just describe to us what 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 is MMA? What is BJJ back then? And and what type of training are you doing? Well, so there was no there was no MMA back then. Um, there was the, the term which was valet chudo, which was the Brazilian term for anything goes. Um, and it's kind of interesting because John Will really is much more of a pioneer than people probably give him credit for. I mean, he introduced jiu-jitsu to Australia. I mean, it was because there was um, a Brazilian who had put in a challenge, I think, in one of the magazines for $50,000. Yeah. He'll fight anyone. Um, you put up 50, he'll put up 50, winner takes all. And John Will, you know, had fought into in, in the pits of India and had fought for a Salat World Championship, you know, bare knuckle fighting. So he was kind of intrigued, but he's also very similar to myself. He has that um, structured approach and he doesn't, he likes to research and understand what he's doing. So before he accepted the challenge, he thought he'd go to Brazil and discover what this jujitsu was that this guy was doing. And, you know, that pretty much opened his eyes and introduced it, um, allowed him to bring it back over to, to Australia. And, you know, um, one of his students is Peter Debean, who now heads the, you know, the AFBJJ, he brought jiu-jitsu over. But what was interesting is back in the day, he, he taught shoot fighting. So he taught Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but he also uh, implemented the, you know, Salat and Muay Thai style striking and then incorporating it with American wrestling and, and he had the belief that you needed to be well-rounded mm. to be a complete martial artist. Yet everyone was like, and then one of the reasons Peter Debean, uh, I believe, you know, I don't want to put words into his mouth, he broke up is because Peter wanted to specifically focus on just jiu-jitsu. And a lot of people going, oh, it's not pure. You're not doing jiu-jitsu. You've got to focus on jiu-jitsu. And look, he ended up uh, predominantly focusing on jiu-jitsu and, um, you know, now has the, the largest organization in Australia with the, the Raw Machado uh, Jiu-Jitsu Association and um, has produced the most number of black belts. But it's just quite interesting that he had the foresight to understand what MMA was and what yeah. really needed to be involved in combat. And that was lucky for me because he had that approach. Anthony Lange did the same thing. We predominantly did Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but we still had a shoot fighting class where we do the Muay Thai and the wrestling and, and try and kind of incorporate it with our, with our jiu-jitsu. And at the time, um, you know, it was all very new. And then, I, as I mentioned, I discovered the UFC through UFC yeah. through, um, the VHS tape. And I'd always been intrigued. And I'd always wanted to kind of test myself in it. I always wondered um, on, on a couple of different levels, one from the personal level, did I have the fortitude to face adversity? If someone were to attack me in the street, would I fall over and cry like a little girl? Or would I stand up and defend myself and my loved ones? So I wanted to know if I had the courage to do that. You know I mean, a lot of us do martial arts for that self-defense aspect. And, yeah. and we, you, have to, you don't know until the situation arises. And the other part was, well, is everything I'm learning actually effective i've seen other people use it but can i use it can i can i apply the jiu-jitsu and the, the striking and the wrestling into a self-defense situation now i'd been in some scuffles in school and interestingly enough it was also always the judo that had won me my fights in school yeah but right. it never really clicked for me as a child um and so what happened was again similar to the john well where the 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 offer to for win fifty thousand came up um, a promoter, Randy Babel, put an ad in the, in the, the Blitz magazine. Um, Australasian UFC coming to Australia, all apply below. Now, the event was promoted and run as the Australasian Ultimate Fighting Championships. But later on, the UFC got wind of it and sued him. Uh, well, threatened to sue him. Yeah. So he changed the name. So he eventually got released as Caged Combat 1. And so okay. he landed to Caged Combat. But the initial selling point was the Australasian UFC. I, I took one look at that and I said, you know what? I want to give it a go. I want to test myself. Wow. I want to test my skills. And so I messaged him and he's like, well, thanks for your message. And, you know, look, I'd won a couple of grappling competitions. I, you know, I was a point fighting state champion, you know, um, national horse 
I'd, got, I'd gone to the national all-stars nationals, but had been disqualified for excessive contact. And <clears throat> I hadn't really done kickboxing or boxing or anything like that. And the promoter's like, look, I, you know, you've, you've done a little bit. You've won a couple of, you know, competitions here and there. You, you're not, not a bad resume, but we've got professional fighters here. Um, and, you know, they, they get preference. I'm sorry, you, you're not going to get a spot, you know. I said, look, no problem. Just keep my details on hand and I'll, I'll, I'll stay in touch with you. And I literally called him every single day. Wow. Just to see how it was going. And, you know, for weeks, it was like nobody, you know, it's like, no, no, no. And then what happened is I think some of the, the professional fighters did what John Will did. They started doing a little bit more investigating. They started hooking up with some of the jiu-jitsu there weren't many jiu-jitsu schools around, but they started reaching out and trying. And then, you know, there was Larry Papadopoulos. Was, he, he'd been in Pancras and Shudo. And um, <clears throat> he had his academy in the city. And there was um, a, a guy called Chris De Weaver in North Sydney. And obviously, John Will um, and Pete Bean. So there was a couple of small academies and things like that around the place. And they start, these fighters started realizing they're probably not going to win this fight. And these okay. guys obviously have high egos and they, they, they just started dropping out. And the same thing, they had a couple of international opponents, which they were trying to bring over from Japan and things like that. And then just slowly, one by one, the, these guys dropped down until one day I've called up the promoter and it was about, I think it was two weeks before, he approached another Australian uh, new body cop before me um, and he was waiting and I called him. He said, look, I'm, I'm, I've approached Neil to see if he wants to spot. It's two weeks before the fight. Um, but if he says no, I'll give it to you. Hmm. And Neil turned it down. He wanted to stay in because there was um, uh, an undercard uh, prelim type spot for an alternate bout. He wanted to keep the alternate position Yeah. because um, he felt it was an easier way into the tournament than... Um, going directly into the tournament and I got off at the spot and I said absolutely so I jumped on board about two weeks before um and so then Elvis, Elvis what what gave you that confidence that that you you know that you're going to do this was it was it the training that you were doing oh no look at I'll that time honest, it, I didn't have confidence yeah okay the whole reason I did it is because I had, didn't have the confidence I doubted I, I had doubts about as to the veracity of my ability to face adversity and have someone punch me in the face and know how I was going to react. I wow. kind of, part of me that kind of knew that I had what it took. Yeah. But because I'd never really been put in that deep situation where it was like, this is it, you know, you're getting punched in the face and you're getting dropped on your head. And how would I react? Do my skills really work? And obviously in the, in the, in the club and, I was doing really well. I was winning comp some competitions, not all of them. You know, I'd, I'd win some second and third in the stuff because I was still fairly new to it. Yeah. I, I think I was the equivalent of about a four stripe white belt okay. um, in, in this first, in this tournament. Um, um, but it wasn't confidence that put me in there. It was the, actually the lack of it. I wanted to wow. actually push myself and test myself and push some boundaries and discover what I was capable of. Yeah, that, that's kind of what got me into it, and so, um, you know, I went in there and yeah, um, yeah. talk us through this and, fight. I'm so fascinated. How did, how again, did it go? What you'll find through my career, you'll see there's lots of links and crossovers, which is quite kind of quite um, it's quite crazy. It, it, it's almost um, funny how things kind of come together mm. um, in the long run. So, I've gone into the this fight, I've come down and at the time, the CSA, um, I don't think they were called the CSA back then, but the Combat Sports Authority were like, oh, we don't want this event to go on. So they were trying to ban it. Hmm. But they could only, they only had legislational control over boxing, wrestling, boxing, boxing, wrestling and kickboxing. So the promoters come to us beforehand and said, look, guys, if you do boxing, wrestling or kickboxing, you can't mention it. You can only mention the martial arts that you train in. If you're a boxer, but you've done karate, you're a karateist. If you're a jiu-jitsu player, then you're a jiu-jitsuist. And I was, a ju I was pushing myself as a jiu-jitsu player, but they already had Mario Sperry in as a jiu-jitsu player. So the promoter says, you're a judo player. Huh. Because I'd done judo before. 
because yeah. he wanted the different styles. He didn't want, you know, like, like that early you know, UFC UFC style. Yeah, he wanted uh, martial art against martial art. So I, I went in <clears throat> as the judo guy, but realistically, I was doing jiu-jitsu back then. Okay. So I had done judo, and it was in my background. Um, I think, no, I think it was judo and taekwondo or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then, so all the different people were promoted as the, a martial arts. So it was a martial arts contest. It wasn't a, 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 a fight night. Mm-hmm. Um, and so quite literally they had police officers at the entrances waiting for the combat sports authority to tell them to shut it down, but they wow. didn't end up, end up doing it. So the event went ahead and it was pretty crazy. It was in Darling Harbour, had about 5,000 people in the venue because obviously oh. it intrigued quite a few people, which is pretty crazy for that time. Big time. Um, and so, you know, I've turned out on my first fight and I'm walking out to the crowd and I was like, oh my God, there were, there were people up on their feet. Because I wasn't the first fight, some of the fights had already gone ahead. The crowd was already into it. They were, so when I, when I got walked out, they went off their feet. They were cheering and going off. And I'm like, my God, this is crazy. Uh, my opponent was already in there. There's a guy named Matt Rocker. And interestingly, many years later, I would catch up with him over Facebook. Yeah. Um, and we would mull over the, the, the match. Um, and he trained with the Lions then. And guess who had come out with him? This little known uh, fighter called Frank Shamrock. What? Was, um, fighting in Pancras um, and training with Ken Shamrock. He was in Matt Rocker's corner. Wow. So I've gone out there and um, I knew who my first opponent was about a week before the fight. So I, I went in with a particular strategy and game plan. Um, I'd already been doing a lot of leg locks. I was very comfortable with leg locks, as we discovered in the ADCC in 2000. Uh, sorry, in 98 when I headed over. And I knew the, the lines then were leg lockers. So I, I came in with an anti-leg lock strategy, um, obviously looking to, to counter his leg locks and then set up my own. Um, and I ended up not needing to counter. I ended up just defending and ground and pounding my way to a victory. And Interesting, one of the photos is, is, is I, I, remember, I could only find it was me punching this um, mat and in the background hanging off the cage looking absolutely dejected is Frank Shamrock, who many years later I would be standing across from yeah. in, in competition. So it's kind of funny how it's kind of linked Everything's up. linked, yeah, absolutely. But what was really interesting is when I walked into the, into the, the the octagon because it wasn't octagon the crowd was going crazy there's this noise everywhere and i'm just like looking and what really the one memory that really sticks in my mind is i remember hearing the gate clang shut so it's this loud metallic clang soon as i've heard that it's almost like everything else has disappeared and the whole world is focused in down the middle and all i could see was my opponent in front of me like I just became super focused. I didn't even notice the referee. The crowd literally disappeared and watching the tapes after they never stopped cheering. But to me, everything just ceased to exist except wow. for my opponent. And then the, the fight goes on and you know, we trade back and forth. He tries to take me down. He can't, he pulls guard. He goes for a leg lock. I defend, I punch, I knock him out. And then as soon as the red ref pulls me off, everything just goes whoosh. and all wow. I remember is the cheering and the chanting and Aussie, Aussie, Aussie and the feeling of elation was just amazing. So what actually got me up back into the sport was this just absolute rush from that first bout. Like I ended up yeah. losing my, my next bout and, um, and then again, that would create history with Chris Hazeman um, yeah. moving forward. Um, and funnily enough, a year later, Chris would actually contact me, drag me out to Japan for rings to face Kiyoshi Tamura. Uh, along with me heading over was this uh, striker who had done no grappling either. Um, and he was being brought over, same as I was, to get kind of thrown to the rules. Some little known fellow called Dan- Danny Higgins. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. He eventually opened integrated martial arts and you know, yeah. the, the likes of Kyle Noka uh, and yeah. that would come out of there. Um, but yeah, and we actually met back in, in 98, heading over to Japan to fight um, in the ring show. Um, and obviously that's where I faced Kyoshi Tamura. He was like 
one of the greatest stars in Japan, one of the biggest names. He was the ring superstar. Yeah. Uh, so it was quite obvious I was there to, lo to lose to him. But it was also the match where I pulled off the first ever <clears throat> uh, Goga Plata in uh, MMA competition. I, I know it's a little bit of a stretch to call it MMA because it, it, there was no close fist punching. But hey, I'm going to I'm going to um, claim it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you should. Te technically, I didn't get um, a tap out. So the match didn't end. The ref stopped the match because my understanding is the submission was on. But when the submission was on and he touched the ropes or we touched the ropes, they stopped the match and restarted it. Um, and after watching the footage, I actually don't think he even touched the ropes. I think the referee dived in to yeah, save right. him because he was the star and the, the ref stopped the submission and restarted, counted it as a rope escape. Yeah. But I don't think there was, a, I don't think he actually did. I don't think he could reach the ropes, but um, you couldn't have me winning the bout. So they ended up no, restarting it. And um, I, uh, again, this will link back to, to Frank Shamrock. Another point in the match, I've sat back for a leg lock on Kiyoshi Tamura. And I was going for what we call a cross ankle lock or a shoelace lock is where, you know, the 50-50 tight position with the legs across, you reach underneath them. Yep. Um, and I always had great success with that when anyone tried to leg lock me. And I'm doing it to him and it's not working. And I'm, I'm like, he's trying to defend and I've stupidly thrown my leg across, left myself open for a cross body heel hook. Um, and he's cranked the heel hook. I've actually grabbed the ropes and rope escaped and stood back up, but I've injured my left knee in the process. He popped one of the, the tendons in my knee, uh, the, uh, the yeah, MCL. And then, so from that point in the match, because my left leg, I couldn't wait on, I actually switched to southpaw. Even though I'm not a southpaw, I'm orthodox. I have spent you, the rest of the fight fighting southpaw. Have you done much training southpaw? Oh, look, I'd done switching before, so yeah, I wasn't okay. unfamiliar with it. Yeah. But I definitely was not as comfortable South Pole as I was. Yeah, was yeah, yeah. Because I came from the Taekwondo background, we used to do a lot of that stance switching of anyway. So that's why I felt comfortable doing the switch. But I definitely wasn't as good. And years later, when Frank would review my footage, he would actually think I was a South Pole. Oh, there you go. Like, How good's that? Uh, the South Pole. Um, that's awesome. Oh, I got yeah, up. The ended up going 10 minutes and... Um, I think just past the 10-minute mark, I'm trying to remember. I think it may have been a, a cross arm bar or something like that. Okay. Um, that I ended up uh, getting caught with. But honestly, it was more gas because uh, I had sure. about 10 days' notice on this match. I pretty much gassed out at the 10 minutes. I'd, um, <clears throat> I felt I'd had the skill to, to finish him, and I think I would have finished him had it not been um, the ref pulling us off on that, that Goga Plata. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I th in hindsight, afterwards, when I I realised what had stopped me from getting the cross uh, ankle lock or the shoelace lock was the shin pads. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because the way it works is you have your shin in the back of your Achilles, which applies the pressure. And when you've got the shin pads, that that stops the pressure. And yeah, it wasn't right. until I tried, I'd never wrestled with shin pads before that event. And it wasn't until I went back home and had I realized that it was <clears throat> what had happened, I would have actually gone for a heel hook and it would have been a whole different situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but again, you, you, you live and learn. Yeah. Um, but interesting, back then, the, the term Goga Plata didn't exist. Yeah. Um, um, for me, it was a move that I called the shin choke, which um, I used to do off failed arm bars. And that's kind of what happened. Uh, in this bout of trying to pass to Moore's guard, he's actually gone for a heel hook, I think an outside, what we would now term an outside ashy. I've rolled to take his back. I've switched over, gone for the arm bar with my leg kind of caught in between. Because my leg was caught, I didn't have the angle to actually hype. I was able to straighten his arm bar arm and apply a little bit of pressure, but he was able to re-wriggle it out. So I then switched to what I used to call back then the shin choke, went for the shin choke, and then he did the rope escape. If you actually jump on the King's Academy social Facebook page or Instagram page, yeah, there's yeah. actually a short, short clip of um, that transition. I, I just put it up recently. Um, awesome, awesome. Absolutely. As, uh, Everyone check that um, out. Yeah, 
So, um, and then years later, the term Goga Plata would come to fruition and yeah. um, people would um, kind of go on there from, from there um, using it as, as and, you know, as, as we know, guys like Nick Diaz and, and so yeah, forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, people, sh- people should just check out this Pancraze uh, event from, from the day, you know what I mean? Because yeah, oh, ring, rings and pancreas, yeah, oh, the rings and pancreas, yeah. fantastic um, grappling exchanges. Absolutely. And just legends of the sport, you know, young, getting at it. And you sort of see, you sort of realize that things that happen today aren't born today. Like they've been happening for two, three decades now, you know, it was happening back then as well. And it, it's, it's, things may be evolving, but not as much as people think, you know, it, it's all based somewhere. That's really cool. Um, and Elvis, I've got to ask you, you know, you went into that first fight as almost like a testing ground for yourself, you know, yeah. and, and what did you learn about yourself after that first fight? Look, I, I definitely, after that, I realized I had, you know, that courage, that fortitude. I wasn't afraid of stepping up or, or facing adversity. As I said, I kind of knew it, yeah. but it was nice to get that confirmation. Um, I realized the skills I'd learning worked. Yeah. Um, what I did find was, again, um, my biggest issue was probably cardio. I didn't understand the depth of requirement that, that your cardiovascular exercise that you needed to, to do that level um, of competition. Um, again, you know, I can blame it on, on short notice, but look, the honest the truth is I wanted to be in it from the day I found out and I was training to be in it from that day. I yeah. just didn't understand <clears throat> how much cardio because i was just i was used to wrestling with our guys in class and doing our striking and we always separated it and we did a little bit of strength and conditioning and um but again it was a whole different thing and that kind of helped us um evolve a lot of the functional training that we did in the day the tire flipping the sand runs the, sure. the sledge hammering uh the battle ropes trying to work out what style of tra- uh, training best suited um, switching over to martial arts competitions, you know, kettlebells. So I, I really um, moved away from your traditional exercise more into that functional type yeah, style, yeah. whole body movements. I like battle ropes. I like kettlebells. I like, yeah. you know, um, the, the souple um, wrestling style workouts, things like that, you know, <clears throat> functional whole body workouts that work not only strength, but conditioning at the same yeah, time. Yeah. And and you mentioned Chris Hazeman um, as well, you, who who you would go on to fight. And you know, listeners, if if you if you read up about this fight between Chris Hazeman and Elvis, so it 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 is a loss. And the the way of losses that I read was chin to the eye. That's correct. Can you talk us through how that happens? So, um, what it was is. Um, it's a combination of things. One, he'd tried it earlier in the fight. Okay. And um, I'd been able to defend it um, just by to, to lock in the um, head. He had to pin my head. He got it into the mount position. Like, he was a very skilled grappler. He was also a lot bigger than He's me. a big guy. He is, a, he, I mean, he is he just an absolute... Jacks, and he'd, he'd also been fighting rings overseas for a long time. I believe he got that from one of the, the, the chin in the eye from another um, rings fighter who had done it. Who had, I'm trying to remember his name, who had done it in the Russian AFC Absolute Fighting Championships um, over there. And he'd, he'd gotten the, the, the chin in the eye. He attempted it, I should say. And I was, I'd been able to escape it. And then I ended up taking his back, almost choking him out. He escaped that. And so, you know, we had a, a fairly um, intense grappling exchange. Oh, look, I'll be honest, and again, that's part of where I, I realized my cardio was lacking. After a couple of minutes, about three or four minutes of grappling, um, my steam started going, and then he got to the mount position again. And instead of doing what I did before and just br- trying to bridge and roll out of it and escape, <clears throat> I was getting tired and a little frustrated at it because I felt it was cheating. I'm like, it says no eye gouging. <clears throat> doesn't yeah. say no eye gouging with the fingers, but the way they interpreted no eye gouging was the use of fingers. Yeah. Whereas I felt sticking anything in the eye is an eye gouge. Yeah, yeah, and he yeah. was sticking his chin in my eye. And <clears throat> as he's doing it, I turned to the ref, gone, ref! And that has allowed it to actually get to him happen. deep. Yeah, right. 
So I turn my head, it's gone in even deeper. I'm like, ref, ref. And the ref is going, fight, fight. And like, and, and at this point, I'm, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. I'm feeling crushing pain in my eyeball. And I've tapped out and he's won the match. And, um, and I, I believe it, it was the wrong thing and it shouldn't have been allowed yeah. simply by the fact that the, the competition changed the rules from our bout because that was a semi-final bout to the final. In yeah. the final, they made it illegal. Yeah, right. So my belief was in the spirit of the rules, it was an illegal move and that they shouldn't have to specify it as a specific move that was illegal. Yeah, look, and I don't think... But again, it is what it is, you know. Um, I, I learned to accept it as a loss. It's just part of my history. I gained a lot from it. I gained a, a better understanding. And I, and I appreciate the reason, you know, Chris had the skill to get to the mount position. I should never have let him get there. My cardio was lacking. Um, and had I not been struggling with cardio, he might not have had the opportunity to, to get that. So there's a lot of factors that I was responsible sure. for yeah. um, uh, as well. But it would also create that history and link with us um, moving forward. Funnily enough, Mario Sperry, I went and saw him after the fight. <clears throat> and I said, look, you know, good luck in the final. I was excited because I said, look, I, as much as I have a great deal of respect for you and I look up to you, but I was really excited about facing you in the competition. I, uh, you're an absolute legend. I just wanted to say thank you. And he goes, look, no problem. I look after you. And during the fight, he, he does this to me. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. And then during the fight, he puts in a little thumb gouge into our uh, Chris Hazelman's <laughs> arm. No. And then the ref comes back to to stop that. And after the fight, I've gone off and I went back and said, congratulations on the win. And he goes, no problem. <laughs> That's great. So that, that was uh, he's got your back. How good. Yeah. How good is that? Look, I, I, I bring it up because it is, you know, for those that, that haven't been around as, as long as you or as long as, you know, most or other people, um, that, that just loss from chin to the eye just encapsulates how different the world was the martial arts the grappling the mma whatever you want to call it how different it was because that's unheard yeah. of you know now well it was pretty much uh, the only rules were no biting no fish hooking no eye gouging those were the three rules that were head butts were allowed like when i won the australian ballet judo open yeah um, i had one of the best head butts <laughs> ever it was pretty awesome so um wow. it was pretty full on back in the day and um even in the events like, I think the first round, we had to wear gloves, but there were no such thing as MMA gloves. We wore bag mitts, like fingerless bag mitts. And then in the second round, we were told we can take them off. We didn't have to wear them. Wow. So wow. the gloves came off because they, were, they weren't useful. And then same when I fought in the Australasian Ballet Judo Open. We had the choice of <clears throat> gloves or no gloves. And I, I think I just fought with hand, uh, tape on my uh, hands. That's Gosh, it. It's a little that's bit incredible. of tape over my knuckles. That's like straight out of kickboxer. You know what I mean? The the tape and then the glue and then the, yeah, all yeah, that sort of stuff. No glue and glass. Um, <laughs> but yeah, pretty much just the tape. And uh, funnily enough, um, that ha uh, the, the, when we had the Australasian um, Ballet Tudo Open, which again was Australia's first ever uh, Australia specific MMA title. Obviously, they'd had the Cage Combat One, which was an international event. Then the first time they ever had an Australian-only event, I won the heavyweight title. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting is in, in the final, I actually ended up facing one of Chris Hazelman's students. So, again, this, right. the links come You're back. Tied in. Um, I ended up taking his back, getting the hooks in, flattening him out, and then punching him. Because you're allowed to punch in the back of the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he had the hooks in, and I was literally dropping bombs in the back of his head. And his face was bouncing off the canvas. And the referee has jumped in to stop it. Now, I give credit to the guy. Um, he didn't tap. He wanted to keep fighting. And I actually started arguing. I'm like, ref, he didn't tap. Let him go. Put me back. Like, yeah, I, wanted yeah. to back. I wanted to finish. I wanted to definitively finish, finish. I wanted to beat him up and <clears throat> choke him out. And then I kind of gone. Oh, why am I arguing for him? That's not my job. That's his coach's job. Yeah, so I, yeah. became, I started, because the crowd started booing. So it, turned, it, it, funnily enough, started turning into a riot, like quite literally rioting. Drinks and bottles started getting thrown all around and the crowd was going crazy. 
Chris was arguing with the referee and the ref's like, nah, it, it's over. Yeah. And I just went, what the hell? And I just put my hands up and I started, oh, I, I've won. I don't, like, it's cause, cause it just clicked. I'm like, why well, I don't need to fight for, I tried to fight for him. And then I just went, well, it's not my job. Yeah, 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 of course. And so this place is going, and it, like, um, it was in the, the Liverpool Whitlam Centre, and I think it was going to turn, ugly. it was starting to turn really ugly, like it was, and then I've got my hands up, and I'm looking around, and just in the corner of my eye, I see this object spinning towards me, and it's this can of VB coming oh. straight from my head. If I didn't see it, it would have hit me clear in the head. I've just turned, looked up. As I've seen it, I've reached up, caught the can. No. <laughs> it was um, an unopened can, so I've just gone. No. <laughs> tossed it. Oh. <laughs> tossed the can into the ground and thrown my hands up. Oh, that's... that's... And the crowd has gone from riding to suddenly cheering. Oh like, my God. Oh. <laughs> That's gonna be the most years. Australian thing I've ever heard. That's amazing. For years, I try to get hands on the footage because the only thing I could think of is those classic VB ads that we had on TV. Yes, yes. Isn't it time for a VB? Having this. Oh my God. Gold. Oh. But sadly, the promoter was the same promoter as the Australasian UFC. When he um, financed this, he apparently didn't have the money and he didn't make enough money to cover his expenses. And he didn't pay the, end up paying the videographers, from my understanding. So the videographers never, ever released the footage. Oh, my goodness. Now it's hidden somewhere. I heard that someone has seen it. And it, this was like 15 years ago or something. Someone had seen the footage and it's it was in like it's old tape and it was in someone's collection. But I have no idea where, if it's still out there or if it's available. But if anyone ever finds it, it will be some of the most classic, like even the fights were absolutely classic, would be amazing yeah. to watch back. Yeah. It's Australian history, but that one moment um, was just absolutely That's um, so cool. amazing. And again, it's again, I fought Chris, in the Australasian, fought his opponent in the final of the, Australia, uh, the Australasian Ballet Chudo Open. Chris ended up bringing, bringing me to um, Japan to fight in rings. He gave me that fantastic, and I'm always grateful to him for that, even though I lost it and I was supposed to be thrown to the wolves. It was an amazing opportunity um, for me. And then many years later, I would actually um, meet up with Chris again at UFC 38, uh, Royal Brawl in the Hall. Um, the first ever event in England, which he ended up fighting. And he ended up fighting Evan Tanner, an opponent I'd already fought previously as well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, it's just amazing how, how interconnected things kind so of cool. are. That's so and it, cool. well, it just shows how small the, the MMA, um, or back then the no holds barred community was back then. Yeah. That's crazy. I, 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 I don't think I'll ever forget. I mean, you just describing this image of you sculling a court VB after winning a, a fight. God, that's a cool story. How fun. Um, Elvis, can you, can you talk us through your, your, as you're training now and as you're, as you're applying your skill more and more, curious about your jiu-jitsu belt progression. So are you ever just fo solely focused on jiu-jitsu and then how does your belt progression go to eventually your black belt? Are oh, you mean for my members? No, for yourself, for, for you, when, when well, you- how, how did it go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously I was in an era where there was not many people in jiu-jitsu uh, jiu in the country. I think um, John Will at the time was, I think a purple belt when I started training and maybe got his brown belt shortly after. Okay. Um, he's around, it was still, maybe he was brown belt, it was still very early days. Anthony Lange was, I believe, <laughs> still a white belt or may have just gotten his blue belt so i was always just behind him he had his blue belt, a white belt he got his purple i got my blue he got his brown i got my purple i got my brown and then we're on brown together yeah um for a while and then um i got my my black belt um and again john well and this is something I, i've taken even a step further 
had a very similar structured approach to his training. So he actually, because he had people all over the place, he had a syllabus in place. So he had set techniques for each belt level that you had to um, demonstrate before you could go to the next level. Now, and he still has that in place and I think it's evolved even more. But back yeah. then it was still um, relatively simple, but it, it was designed to show that you had the fundamental understanding in certain areas of your jiu-jitsu to be able to progress. So when he was able to go from state to state to, to do seminars and to grade people, he had kind of a standard to base it off. Um, so I, you know, I did, when I graded, I did the, the stripes and um, with his system, his was a little bit different. It was um, because there was no structure to the IBJJF. It didn't exist back then. Yeah. Um, he had, you know, you're on white belt, you have three stripes and then, no, I think it goes four, three, two, one. So as you got closer, so the number of belts you're away from black belt was the number of stripes you had on your belt. It made sense um, at the time. So yeah. as you got closer, you got less stripes on your belt. Um, he used to do, you had a blue belt. If you had a white belt, you had four stripes, you got four blue stripes. Once you got a blue belt, you had three purple stripes. And once you got a purple belt, you had two brown stripes. When yeah, you got a brown okay. belt, you had one black stripe and then yeah. you got your white stripe when you got a black belt. Obviously, once the IBJJF set their standard where you can have um, you have the four stripes on the adult belts and adding the kids' belts and then adding the stripes on the kids' belts, obviously, we followed through and, and stuck to that format. But we used um, his system to develop our syllabus as well. We took it another step further. Um, so we created... Um, the way I like to structure it is white to blue belt was teaching you all your fundamental positions. So once you got the blue belt, you should know attack and a defense from pretty much all your fundamental positions, mount, side control, guard, back control, knee ride, and the turtle position. So, um, so if you have at least, um, a le you must have at least a defense from every one of those positions and from most of them an attack from those positions. Mm -hmm. And that I give is how I would look at a, a blue belt. Yeah. So from blue belt onwards is when we would start developing our different guards. So then you'd start adding in butterfly guard, open guard, heart guard, even though, oh, uh, even though we taught all that earlier. So you, just because you're not grading for it doesn't mean you're not taught it. Yeah, of course. You might have tested on it until you're, it's an appropriate level. So then we start adding the more advanced guards and then, Obviously, if you add the different guards, you have to add the uh, fundamental passes to those guards. And then it just kind of evolves from there, going yeah. more into leg locks. Um, and then more of the advanced guards, your X guards, single X guards, yeah. um, going into our Ashy series and all that sort of stuff, which we've added um, over the years as well. Awesome. So... Um, I kind of followed that structured approach where you get your stripes and then you get your presented your belt when you're ready for your belt. So with our guys, you grade for stripes. You've got to demonstrate techniques. You've got to put in time on the mat um, and then belts are presented when you're ready. And that's a combination of showing us you're ready by learning the moves on your stripes and then competing and training and rolling on the mat. And then when the skill level is there, you're ready to, to jump up okay. uh, to the next level. And, and can you describe to us, uh, Elvis, when you got your black belt? Was it a ceremony? Who was there? Or all that sorts of stuff? Um, so it was pretty much um, because, again, um, it was from initially John Will gave me my, my black belt. I've been training under Anthony Lange. He was my coach. Um, I think he had gotten his not long before. Uh, but obviously, a new black belt can't present a black belt. I think sure. back in the day, it was first or second stripe you had to be to give a black belt. So John Will um, came down to, to Sydney, taught a seminar at Anthony Lange's um, Academy and presented me um, my black belt there with some of my other training partners and yeah, okay. uh, other, other members from uh, Lange's Academy as well. So it was a little, it wasn't a, a big fanfare but it was um a pretty cool thing and you know um the people that mattered were kind of there for me yeah and because you because you, because you sort of entered in the fighting realm so early on 
did, did getting a black belt seem like a huge achievement because you're already achieving so much in your martial arts career at this stage. So was it a big deal getting your black belt? Oh, uh, look, absolutely. Um, I mean, as I said, when I started, blue belt was looked up as, well, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, because yeah, yeah, yeah. back then blue belt was uh, the equivalent of a lot of other martial arts black belts. You know, mm. you had to, it was, you know, years of training. Like I've known people who've been blue belt for six, uh, who, well, white belt for six years before they got their blue belt and yeah, things like yeah, that. Yeah. Like if the progression was a lot different. There was a lot higher expectation, particularly if you weren't Brazilian. You, there was yeah. a lot harder uh, process to, to kind of get graded and ranked. And um, they didn't want to water down the art and there was no structures or guidelines. It was pretty much um, each academy had their own standard by which you had, you had to be graded. So Absolutely. Black belt was an amazing achievement when I got my black belt. Um, you know, John Will was what's known as the Dirty Dozen, one of the first non 12 non-Brazilian yeah. uh, black belts in the world. I was one of the Australian Dirty Dozen, one of the first Australian um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts um, here. So, you know, of course it was a great That's honor. A big deal. That's um, cool. It was just, again, it was just something else that was really cool you know we're fighting adc first ever adcc world championships you know first australian in the ufc um first australian to fight for a world title it was just all cool it, every single one of those um was just as important yeah. uh, a landmark uh, for me as well and, and even now each time i get a stripe um because i ended up because i'd been training predominantly under, under anthony Langey, which was under john well um, and I still have a great deal of respect for John Well, and I'm mean, I, I, still part of his association here in Australia. Um, but I started having a lot more um, connections with uh, Carlos Machado. So I think around Purple Belt, I started heading overseas, competing in the world, uh, the, the you know the Mundials, the World Championship in Brazil. In Brazil, and we'd always drop in um, to to Texas and you know do some training with Carlos. I got to know Carlos. Not just as a coach, but in a, at a personal level. And then, you know, I got my black belt from John Well, and then we were bringing um, Carlos Machado over, who was doing um, seminars at our academy. He was um, coming down, and um, he, John, uh, Carlos offered to, to continue grading me. Mm. Uh, he said, Look, you know, I'd like to take you under my wing. You know, I consider you one of my guys. Um, and I said to him, I said, Look, I'm greatly honoured, but first, before um, I do that, um, I need to obviously clear it with John Will. I called John. I said, look, John, um, it's not nothing disrespectful, but the opportunity to grade d directly under Carlos, I'm, I hope you understand, it's just a fantastic opportunity. And he goes, look, no, I understand. I feel the same way. I have a great hit relationship with Hegan, and yeah. I'm glad you have the same one. Um, with Carlos and he gave me his blessing and so um, my okay. first, second, third and fourth degree stripes have come from Carlos Okay. Um, but I, I'm still, you know, a part of the, the Will Machado in Australia <clears throat> I always do my best to help John out um, at his tournaments, at the gathering his yeah, yeah, yeah. That they have every year I make sure I come down, support it I, like, I actually take photos for the events uh, uh, for him I mean, obviously do any coaching and um, if I have to jump on and ref the odd match as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, awesome. you know, he has a fantastic organisation. Um, the culture and his approach to jiu-jitsu was very similar to mine and it carries across uh, in our academy. And I like to, um, you know, give him the credit that, you know, he paid a part in where I am today. Fantastic. Oh, that's really cool, Elvis. Um, can, can, you, can you tell us now at this part of your journey, how you then get into the UFC. What, what, what's the pathway that leads to that? Well, uh, again, we go back to it's back to an era that isn't the same as today. There was yeah. no um, Zoom or mobile phones or even the internet, were, internet was absolutely limited. There was um, no YouTubes or forums or yeah. um, Facebook or social media. Um, what there were was message boards and mailing lists. Wow. Okay. So um, I'd actually tried to get into the UFC. I'd contacted John Peretti and emailed and he'd called and spoke to me looking at getting me over. But the cost of airfare for myself 
So the cost to play me, my FA and my coach was excessive. I even offered to fight for free and they said it's still too excessive to <clears throat> fight you and a coach over for the UFC. And, and he goes, and John goes, oh, and honestly, I don't think you're the level of the UFC. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. Um, and so that opportunity didn't come up, but I was on this mailing list called the combat list. Um, and then there was also um, a, a forum called Submission Fighting, um, which we would become the underground, which later on became MMA TV, which is one of the biggest forums out there. Um, Kirik, you know, I give a lot of credit to, has done wonders with spreading the word of MMA um, through the world with that. But we're on this mailing list and I caught up with uh, two promoters. One was for an organization called the UCC, Universal Combat Challenge which would later on become TKO, which GSP came out of. Okay. And the other one was this guy called um, Joe Silva, who was uh, an assistant to John Peretti. So, you know, I kind of met these guys on the forums and <clears throat> um, I tried to get into the UCC uh, for a fight in Canada. Um, and they, like, I wanted to get in at light heavyweight and they said, look, we've got too many light heavyweights. We don't have many heavyweights. You want to fight at heavyweight? And I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. So I was scheduled to fight in the second tournament uh, at heavyweight for the UCC. And then about 10 days, a week before uh, the first UCC, they had a, a title fight between Chemo and this, uh, I can't remember, it was a, it was a French guy. Yeah. Um, and he ended up having a car accident and breaking his neck and then having three vertebrae fused. Wow. Um, before the event, so they lost an opponent. And they called me and they said, "Look, do you want to fight um, Chemo for a world title, a world heavyweight title?" I went, "Shit, yeah, why not?" <laughs> wow. Um, so and so I've gone. All right, let's let's head over um, for that. So this was in October of two thousand. So yeah. I've then flown over to there, and, and while I was on the flight over. Chemo broke his finger. Now, there's a big story behind it, but basically he pulled out of the fight. I won't get into too much detail um, on that, but he wouldn't talk. He stopped communicating with the promoters, put photos up and x-rays on AD combat. Um, but they lost my opponent. And I got over there and they said, look, we haven't got an opponent for the title fight. Do you want to fight Tom Erickson? And I'm like, look, I was actually getting ready to fight Tom Erickson back in um, uh, 98, 99, when we we're going to have the second um, cage combat. I'd already agreed to it. Um, I'm happy to fight him. The guy's 300 pounds though. I want a training camp. I like, this guy's an American wrestler, 300 pounds. I'm going, he's not the sort of person I want to fight on short notice. I need yeah. to prepare for someone that big. Yeah. And they've gone, oh, how about, Dan Severn, I'm going, he's like 280, 290. They're not much different. I'm like, they're basically the same guy. They're just different names. I said, look, if it's easier on, on you, put those two guys together for the title fight and I'll just fight on the um, undercard. Give me a, a local, I'll fight anyway, you know, I'll fight, because um, I, I at least knew who they were and what these guys were capable of. And I just didn't think they deserved fighting me on short notice because I was not going to put in the sort of performance I, I thought I was capable of. Yeah. So they turned, they went, no problems. We want you on the card, so we'll find someone else. Then they offered me Jeremy Horn. <clears throat> and I'm like, well, yeah, I'll take Jeremy. I know who Jeremy is. I knew he was dangerous. I think at that point he'd already submitted Chuck Liddell. He'd fought Minotauro and Anderson in Japan and stuff. He lost to them by decision, but you just knew his skill level was up there. So I'm like, <clears throat> absolutely, I'll take that fight. And then for whatever reason, Jeremy turned it down, didn't want to come up, uh, didn't know enough about me. Um, so uh, opted not to take the fight. And so then they offered me Dave Benito. Now, Dave Benito, again, was another UFC guy. I, I, I remember I knew he fought Carlos Bajeto in the UFC, I think, but beat Carlos, who was a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. And I think at this stage, I was either a blue or purple belt in Jiu-Jitsu. I'm like, this guy's good and he's big. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure this guy's 260, 270. Yeah. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. 
he's only 240. And I went, fair enough. I was willing to fight Chemo, who was in the, the 230s. And this guy, this guy's really 240, 245, what they're saying. I'm like, um, oh, no, sorry. They go 235. He's 235, 240. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, Chemo was... 230, 235, not far off. You know, he might be five, 10 pounds heavier. Sure. He's under 240. I can live with that. And then, so I've agreed to the bout. We've signed it. And I was probably not even walking around at 200 pounds. Whoa. So for the weighing, I actually weigh in with tracksuit pants. If you ain't see any photos, I'm wearing tracksuit pants. The reason being, underneath my tracksuit pants, I put on ankle weights. And I put hand weights in my pockets because I didn't want to, I didn't want them to know just how long I was. Oh my goodness. I, ended up weighing, I, in, I think I had about five kilos, 10 pounds of weights on me. So I weighed in, I think about 210 with my tracksuit pants on. You know, I took the top off and did the press <laughs> off. And, and I was probably under 200. Wow. Uh, and then, um, Dave hops on the scale, doesn't take his top off, and I'm thinking he's looking freaking big. Like he's obviously overweight as well. And they go 264, two, no, 265 pounds. I'm like, <laughs> shit. I'm like, shit. So I'm, oh I'm giving up about 65 pounds in weight. And I'm like, okay, it is what it is. I've agreed to it. At least he's out of shape. I have that at least to some sort of advantage. <clears throat> so the fight ended up going ahead. It ended up being two 10 minute rounds, ended up being a draw in the end. I, I think I got screwed. And that's, again, another set of footage that was never released. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the fight went to air, but the footage was never provided or given to me because during the fight, I was kicking the, the crap out of um, Benito's legs. Like yeah. my one strength was, uh, my leg kick. So what happened at the start of the fight is he took me down straight away. Yeah. And I almost armbar triangled him. And he, he, he's like, shit. And almost swept him. Like, he, like, I just went straight into attack mode. And after that, every time he took me down, he literally just put his head in my chest and punched the side. And so every time the ref would stand me up. So I'm like, I'm not going to defend the takedowns. I just went and just kick the crap out of his legs. He would shoot and take me down. I'd pull guard. And then I would just wait for him to posture up. But he never postured up after that first exchange. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think at the very end of the first round, I ended up taking him down with a single leg. And I was just like so excited. And as I've dived in to throw my, my first elbow, the buzzer's gone. Oh. So I'm like, oh, shit. So we get re stop the mat match stops and... Um, and, you know, by this point, um, my cardio is much better because I've learned my lesson from the, the yeah. even in a short notice fight, my, my cardio, I was ready to go 20 minutes. That wasn't going to be an issue. So same thing. Um, I start kicking him. He takes me down. I, we get stood up. I kick him. And this time he takes me down. And, and, and as he's taking me down, I start posting off his hip, pushing back. And as he's reaching to grab my head and pull me in, I pull him into what we call a cutting armbar or a prone yeah. armbar. I've locked in the arm. I've got my feet in his hip. I've got my, my, my his hand trapped here. Now, I hadn't cranked it on, so but it was obviously on. The arm was straight. And I'm starting to apply pressure. And he goes, stop, stop, stop. And I'm like, there's a bit of a quick tap. But I'm holding and I'm like, rep, rep. He wants to stop, rep. And I'm I've been the good guy here. I'm not cranking the armbar. In hindsight, I probably should have. Yeah. Well, what happened is the ref stops it and he goes, oh, what's going on? He goes, the guy, Dave goes, oh, I dislocated my knee. Oh, because what had happened, I'd kicked it so much that when he was driving to try and push forward to, to get my head, because I'd kicked and weakened the side of his legs so much, his knee had popped. Oh. Um, and so they stopped him out the match they put the leg back in and i'm like yeah i've won i'm the heavyweight champion of the world i was so excited i'm like i've got this belt and anthony langley my voice of reason goes sit down i'm like no no i've won he goes no no you haven't won until the referee has raised your hand 
don't let your don't get an adrenaline dump. I want you to calm down. I want you to sit down and relax. Wait. So I sat down. I'm like, but they can't. They can't restart it. I'm like, he he, he gave up. He verbally tapped. And then the ref goes to Dave Benito. He goes, so they they're giving him about five minutes while the ref, the doctor, put it back. Gave him a bit of a rest. He even had a drink of water. And the ref goes, do you want a further a longer break? And he goes, yes. And the ref goes. If you want a longer break, I'm going to have to disqualify you. And he goes, oh, no, I'm ready to fight then. And the ref goes, okay, stand up. We'll continue. And I'm like, what? And, like, it was the funniest thing is because I was just pissed. Yeah, absolutely. So I've literally just, like, he must have seen the anger. I've just literally run at him to throw the hardest leg kick. And he's literally turned around and ran. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, and I, I started chasing him. And then he's, again, as I've started chasing him, he, turned, he literally turned and just, I've literally run into a double leg. Yeah, right. So he put me on my back, held me down um, for the rest of the fight. And it ended up going to decision. And I'm like, how does it, how do I, how does it become a draw? Like he tapped, I kicked the shit. He did zero damage to me, which actually reminds me, he actually did a really smart thing in the first round. In the first round, I'd cut him open with an elbow. Yeah. Um, I think I did it off my back as well. And I saw the cut open up. And what he's done is he's dug his head into my chest. And I, cause I could feel him pushing, driving my, his head, like trying to drive it through my chest into the floor. He actually used it to close the cut. What? This is the pressure. This is quite wow. Important. Wow. Uh, obviously in between rounds they were able he was able to stop it bleeding. Obviously it wasn't a massive cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was I have to give him credit. It was very smart of him. But anyway, still I, I did all the damage in this fight. Yeah. Um and and I ended up being a draw and one and I'm like, how is it a draw? And when I spoke to the judges afterwards, they're like the scoring criteria were given rated takedowns really high so because he did so many takedowns and you did all the damage it was a draw and i'm like but how does takedowns count when he did nothing with it and yeah. he got stood up every time and then and then again that's why the i think the reason they gave him the draw was because he was the hometown canadian and they didn't want to give the belt to the international the, the international guy i don't know it's just yeah it's yeah, yeah disappointing it's like it would have been my, my first world title yeah but so I get this fight here. And then um, after this fight, I actually got contacted by Frank Shamrock's manager. Huh. And he's like, oh, look, Frank's looking for a possible opponent for K1 in um, Japan. Would you be interested? I'm like, oh, absolutely. I'll fight Frank. I knew who he was, five times world champion. Sorry about this. My story is long. We will get to how I got into the US. No, this is great. This is great. I'm, I'm to the end. I'm loving it all. You know, we got Frank's manager contacted me and I'm like, yeah, I'm absolutely keen. They said, oh, look, if the, if the opportunity comes up, we'll get back to you. And I'm like, okay. They never got back to me and I was watching the forums and Frank. So what Frank was doing was he was trying to get um, either Yuki Kondo or Kiyoshi Tamura. So Yuki was the name of Pancras and Kiyoshi was the guy I fought the yeah. name of him. So he wanted a big name Japanese fighter. He wanted to fight them in K1. He wanted to beat them so he could get into pride. So he was trying to get into pride so he could face Kazushi Sakuraba. Yeah, of so, course. Um, and the reason they contacted me is because I'd fought Kiyoshi Tamura and they, they, they were aware of it and they had that footage of the tape. They saw I'd fought in the UCC, but because of the travesty of the, the match, the footage never got released. So he didn't have that footage. So as far as he knew, I was a, so it goes back to, he thought I was a Southpaw. Ah, if he'd seen, of course. If he'd seen the UCC footage, he would have seen I was orthodox and all my kicks were done from the orthodox position. Yeah, yeah. Um, but because they never released the footage again, so it was a benefit in that fight, he, knew, he didn't know that. So what happened was he kept backwards and forwards in and about a couple of weeks before Kiyoshi pulled out because rings went, no, you can't fight in K1. They're the competition. Yeah. Yuki was given more um, free reign because I think he'd been allowed to fight in, in Pride already. And, and I think he had, so they were getting close, they were getting close. And then again, about a week, 10 days before 
he pulls the plug or Pancras pulls the plug, whatever happens is it drops out. Like yeah. Yuki is no longer being considered for the match. And so Frank's, um, Frank's manager has called me. He's gone, look, will you fight Frank? Sure. And he goes, it's in a, a week and a half. And I'm like, shit, okay. So, you know, it ended up um, being going into the fight. It was a five round fight. Wow. Uh, and again, um, it was on short notice. And yeah. Frank, Frank is known for cardio. And it was a high paced fight. And again, if you actually jump onto uh, our Facebook page, uh, the Kings Academy, I've actually got the, um, the, the video. Someone posted, I didn't even know it was uh, available online, but the fight is actually cool. um, available. And you can watch the whole fight there. Um, so it's quite funny because again, it was one of the things, and it, it's interesting that this happened recently at the end of the third round, um, uh, my coat, I've come back to the corner and I'm gone. I'm exhausted. I have nothing left. Yeah. I'm like, I've given everything to try and beat Frank. I don't think I could do it. And Langy's gone. What are you talking about? He goes, I'm exhausted. He goes, no, you're not. I go, look at Frank. Frank's tired too. And Frank was sitting there. He was exhausted. I'm like, he's like, you're not tired. And he goes, you can do this. I know you can. And I went, okay. I just went, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm not going to argue with my coach. You know me, but you know me as well as I know myself. He goes, you're going to go out there. You're going to try and beat him. And I think the fourth round was one of my best rounds as well. Huh. Um, hey, after that. It ended up going um, five rounds. It was a very close match. Um, he won it. I, I, I think he won it. I don't have any issue with it. So, some people say they thought I won it. Um, I was definitely more offensive through the match. I think I had him in more danger in submissions. And again, it was. Um, I knew he was a leg lock guy. Again, yeah. we go back to the, the original fight with um, Matt Rocker and him in the corner and knowing his pancreas. And I actually baited him and gave him my leg so he'd attack the leg lock. And I, back before it was known as um, outside Ashley, I was hitting outside Ashley going for the heel hook. Um, I set it up and when he counted, I tried to switch for a knee bar. And then I think there's a couple of good photos showing him grimacing um, from it because he thought he was going to leg lock me. And I'm like, uh -uh, not happening. I'm confident with my leg locks here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It for, for a while. Um, I had a couple of, you know, other submission attempts. Um, I was playing De La Hiva. I had no, I don't think De La Hiva, I'd even ever heard the term. I just know it, knew it as an outside hook, almost yeah. took his back. Um, but because I was not a position I'd done a lot of, um, I wasn't able to take advantage of, but it was a really cool scrap. You know, there's a lot with a lot of backwards and forwards. I threw a lot of kicks through that. Um, match and he he wasn't ready for the, the the kicking I did because he was thinking I was a southpaw and stuff. So, um, but it was a fun match and um, so now I had history with Frank Shamrock. Yeah, <laughs> now we've got the connection with Frank Shamrock. Um, us going back to the, the the first cage combat now uh, K1 in Japan. Frank Shamrock in his last fight and I think it was his last fight in the UFC had beaten Jeremy Horn by knee bar submission. That's why I was also trying to get that knee bar as well. Um, it would have been cool to get it, damn it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, funnily enough, like this is um, December of 2000. I'd fought Veneto in October of 2000. January of 2001, I get a phone call from Joe Silva. And he's like, this is like 4, 4 a.m. in the morning or something like that because of the time difference. Mobile phones were still fairly new. I think I had a flip phone. Nice. Um, and I get this phone call at 4 in the morning. go, hey, hey, Elvis, this is Joe. I'm like, holy shit, Joe. I've been chatting to you on the forum. I've never heard your voice before. <laughs> like, this is really cool. And he's like, look, um, he'd now taken over from John Peretti. Zufra had purchased... <clears throat> Um, the UFC from SEG, they were going to hold their first event. And again, this will link back to um, Dana White and um, Donald Trump in the Trump Taj Mahal. So the very wow. first UFC event was in, oh, sorry, the very first Zufa UFC yeah. event was in the Trump Taj Mahal. And I think that's why, you know, Dana has that connection with Trump um, going yeah. forward now. But anyway, so they, this event's going ahead and he goes, look, 
Uh, Jeremy Horn was supposed to fight Cafe Dante, who's a uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. I think I was still 2000. I was probably still a, still a purple belt at that stage. Um, maybe close to my brown belt. But he was supposed to fight Cafe Dante for the number one contender spot to face Tito. Yeah. And Cafe Dante ended up getting a massive uh, staph infection, ended up with a hole in his leg and had to pull out. And this is like last minute. And, and Joe's like, look, you fought Frank. You went the distance with Frank. Frank couldn't beat you. This is the way they were looking at it. Even though he yeah. won the decision, they're like, Frank couldn't beat you. Yeah. But Frank beat Jeremy. So it's a perfect story. You, you're the guy. You can face Jeremy. This is the guy Frank beat last. Can you beat him? Will he beat you? Now, they were pretty much banking on him beating me. Yeah. So beating the guy. So if Jeremy could submit me, then I, he'd submitted the guy that Frank couldn't submit, who was the last guy to submit Jeremy. And they, they had this story, and it would have been perfect to get Jeremy into um, the UFC. So that's how um, my fight kind of came about in there okay. because of, again, all that interconnections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost fighting him in um, the, the UCC as well. But a really interesting um, side story is obviously back then we didn't have the internet. We just had message boards and um, mailing lists. There was a, a paper which was called Full Contact Fighter, which later on became a news website and forum and all that sort of stuff. But it only came out in paper format. Mm. So we'd get it in Australia, but it'd always be a month after the events. And so Full Contact Fighter would put out regular papers and in it they would put predictions. <clears throat> or any of the main event UFCs and co-main event fights, and they just get predictions from fighters and coaches and things like that, and and for other and for hook and shoot events and things like that. They're a big supporter of hook and shoot. So we only ever saw the predictions after the shows because because they didn't come to Australia until after because of the the distance. So for the first time ever, I actually read one before the event, and it was before the event I was fighting in. Ah, so it had yeah. my predictions in my fight. Now, Tito was facing Evan Tanner and the fighters with coaches were actually split 50-50. Hmm. My prediction was 100% everyone predicted that Jeremy Horn would win by submission in under three minutes. Wow. <laughs> so I've read this and I've gone, well, my strategy is to beat him by submission in under three minutes. So my goal was like, it's funny, my goal initially was to, to defend the takedown and strike with him. Like, I, I felt I had the better striking and I think I was going to be able to outkick him and everything. And when I read this, I went, nope, I'm going to pull guard and I'm going to submit him. Yeah. Because I knew I didn't have the wrestling, like I, I wasn't going to go for takedowns. And so I ended up submitting him with the triangle armbar. Wow. Years later, would be, um, someone would term the dead orchard, which uh, Danaher actually calls the dead Elvis because he says, I did it first. There you go. The triangle armbar with the, the second arm in, uh, in two minutes and 59 seconds of the bout. Oh, oh, what? That is so cool. That is so cool. Awesome. And then, the, and then that's it? And then you're, in, and you're fighting in the... Well, orchard. Yeah, then it's kind of... Well, um, obviously, I won that, and that's also where the finger point comes from. I've won this match. I'm so excited. I'm bouncing around, just waiting for the referee to lift my hand. And as I look around, I see this cameraman. He's literally at my feet. He's got this camera pointing up at me. And I'm like, oh, there you are. And I've just looked down the barrel of the camera, kissed my finger, and pointed. And what, it, just, it just felt it right? Just, it just... I don't, it just, <laughs> I don't know why I did it. I just went, I'm the winner. It's like, I'm the winner. I yeah. won, number one. I'm awesome. And then my hand. <clears throat> and so that's where the, the king finger point kind of came Oh, that's so that. cool. Um, but it was also not just because I did it then. The UFC took that and used it in their f f promo video. So they'll promo, promo and pay TV. So they had all these montages of, People walking into the ring, fighting, slams, punches. And then at the end, all the hands are getting raised. And then at the very end of the montage was me. 
And then That's when they cool. release the video game, they use that same montage and on the, vid the very first copies of the video game, it's got me doing the finger point. Oh, so cool. And I've got this cheeky sort of grin as I'm doing it as well. It's, uh, like, I was like, yeah. That's um, and cool. I got lucky. I was actually a featured character in the UFC, the original video game on the PS2. Yeah. And then later on, on, on the Xbox. And I was actually a character, one of the, because they had a lot of characters. They only had about a dozen that were in the actual manual. And I was one of the featured ones um, because of this, because of the submission and all that. And again, this goes back to myself being a nerd. One of the things I did in the early days was promote, promote myself as the world's toughest nerd. Um, yeah. you, know, you know, pay homage to my IT career and all that sort of stuff. And when they were doing the video game where they, where they had to do all the measurements and uh, create your character, the guys told me, they said, we're going to create a special um, combination move for you so that you've got a, a power move that's better than everyone else. Just yeah. because they go, you're one of us. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I, used to remember, I used to play people on the game and then I'd go, aha. And I did this spinning kick that just came out of nowhere. And they're like, holy shit, what was that? I'm like, yeah. My, my special I Elvis. I, I, I haven't played it for years. And I can't remember what the... The actual button, yeah, 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 that's so cool. I was thinking that. Oh, look, it's coming full circle back to Elvis's nerdy side. So that's that's yeah, super so, cool. Yeah, that's super cool. Joints. Awesome, awesome. So, Elvis, when you you know we haven't we haven't covered no, we haven't covered all of it. We haven't even covered most of it. We sort of just hit off yeah. some of the some of the wave tops. But you know, when you think back at it now, what are your what are your sort of highs and what are your sort of lows coming through the game? Oh, um, look, honestly, um, look, we'll probably have to do another podcast. I think we will. I think we will. Absolutely. Um, really not a lot of lows. It's really mostly highs. From my awesome. career. I've enjoyed everything, even the losses, um, even the, like, I, my fight getting stopped because of a cut with Tito and then having a, a doctor ruin my fight against Evan Tatter. Um, they're lows. But they're highs. They're experience I yeah, take into yeah, that yeah. helped um, forge who I am today. Um, you know, as as, as, as um, they say, it, it, you either you, you either win or learn. And it, for me, I really have taken that on board. Every time has been a learning experience. I never fought. I mean, I always wanted to be world champion. Don't get me wrong. I fought yep. to be the best. I wanted to be the best. I possibly could be but it was more about my journey being the best i could be yeah and if by the that journey i, I become the best in the world then so be it um so for me it was always about the toughest challenge never so much about creating a record or a career and so you know i, I ended up fighting five um ufc world champions um <clears throat> as you mentioned at the start yeah you know ortiz evan Tanner. Um, Michael Bisping, uh, Forrest Griffin, um, uh, all these guys, future world champions, you know, Jeremy Horn, who was IFC world champion, uh, Hanato Babalu, I think, held a world championship in one of the other um, events. It was always about the toughest, hardest, yeah. um, best challenge um, possible. Um, I, I, you know, when I went to overseas i just wanted to fight the best guys to test myself to really see what i was capable of what limits um was i possible able to to kind of surpass and exceed and um so yeah I, no lows you know even the chin in the eye the, the stoppages they're not lows they're just part of my career they help awesome. develop who i am they're all highs um i have taken so much experience without those I wouldn't have, you know, King's Academy. I wouldn't have the knowledge, the understanding. I've taken a lot of my experiences into what I give to my students, understanding the value of recovery uh, equal to that of training and, and, and so forth. So, yeah, it's just been a, an amazing journey and it just continues to be amazing. Awesome. Awesome. And when you sort of look to the future, what, what, what's next for Elvis? So, look, I mean, we're coming out of lockdown. So it's always about um, continuing to build what I have here. I want to, to create the next um, 
generation of champions mm. from the six from my three year old all the way up to our current competitors. I want um, more guys who can compete and be the best in the world. But I want to create coaches who are able to pass on their knowledge and yeah. our, our culture and, and help those people. Some of my greatest achievements aren't winning belts and titles, but they're helping people overcome their, their personal obstacles. So I want to do that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's part of how I become um, the, the head of the UFC Gyms Australia BJJ program. So I oversee their BJJ program because the reason I wanted to do that is because they have a greater access to the sort of person who normally wouldn't be interested in combat martial arts. Yeah. So if we can bring jiu-jitsu to the average person, it's just a great opportunity to do that. Um, I'm in the process of setting up my own UFC gym, uh, hopefully uh, in a couple of months, early next year, continuing to expand and build uh, the people that we're developing here um, in King's Academy. I've managed to um, build some great students. I've got guys like um, Luke Martin, Sydney West Martial Arts, Chris Bowles with Team Anaconda, um, I've got uh, the, the Daniel, Daniel and Lance who have Forza Jiu Jitsu. They've just opened up um, recently in the inner West as well. Yeah. So these guys are opening up their academies. They're passing on not just the skills that I've um, passed on, but the culture, the attitude, um, and they're helping the next generation of people as well. So, you know, I'm very proud of, of that and then I've got a lot of other students who've opened up their own academies um, be, without being affiliated me you've got um, Ben from SG, SBG, John from Higher Health, Tony from Pure Jiu Jitsu, they've gone their own they've, they're not affiliated with me but I still have a great deal of pride um, in what they're achieving and it's great seeing these guys continue to pass on the, the skills, the knowledge and the culture as well so yeah. um, just it's just being part of that and seeing that continue to, to grow has just been um, absolutely amazing. That's fantastic. Well, Elvis, look, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on and, and being on the show and sharing some of your stories with us. And you, you mentioned before we got to do another episode, so I'm, I'm going to hold you to yeah, that. Well, Cause we, we got, to, got into the MMA. We, we barely touched onto the jujitsu. I know. And, I know. So uh, I've we've got a lot of history with that as well. Absolutely. So you, um, and I love the sport dearly. Um, I'm sure. I, mean, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't still be doing it. Um, look, the, even though we have an MMA gym and boxing and kickboxing and wrestling, jiu-jitsu is still our largest student base. Yeah. Um, here we have a ridiculous amount of jiu-jitsu students, great competitors, numerous jiu-jitsu champions along with boxing, wrestling, um, MMA champions as well. So awesome um, awesome Let, well let's lock it in you heard it here first listeners we will we will be back for part two uh well, with I elvis be your first return guest yeah 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 absolutely i'm a pioneer I, it needs there you to go be <laughs> there you go it's gonna be great and no, i'm looking forward so listeners i hope you have enjoyed uh this episode of behind the black belt with elvis sinisic now if you want to find out more about elvis head on over to his website that's www.elvisinisic.com uh, and you can follow him on all the socials. He's on Instagram. You can find him there at the.elvis.sinisic. And you can find him on Twitter and Facebook at Elvis Sinisic. And as we mentioned before and talked through this episode, if you're looking for somewhere to train, you want to go to where the best are going, head out to King's Academy of Martial Arts. You can find all you need to know at www.kingsacademy.com.au. And Elvis, look, uh, this has been a dream come true for me. I have been following your career for such a long time. It has been an absolute pleasure to, to get to know you, hear some of those cool, cool, cool stories. I can't wait till we can uh, hear some more. Um, have you got any final words before we wrap up? Look, a couple of things I want to point out. Um, Please. Just very quickly before I wrap up. Uh, obviously, King's Academy. Thank you very much for sharing that. But we also have, um, we run Sydney Hot Yoga out here. We run Hot Yoga because I believe awesome. it's a great complement to Jiu-Jitsu. We have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, which is fantastic for sports performance, which is available for hire. Um, and as well as for helping um, ill people and sick people. So we have that oxygen chamber. So oxygen at King's. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a I'm a big believer in recovery is just as important in training. We have that all here. So just keep that in mind. Sydney yeah. Hot Yoga, Oxygen at King's, along with King's Academy of Martial Arts. Um, again, even if you, you're out of 
the area and you can't become a member, we're always open, drop in, jump in. Um, our club is open to all affiliations. Um, our open mats, we have a Sunday, 8 a, uh, 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. open mat. Any affiliation, we just charge a $10 mat fee. Anyone can wow. come down and jump awesome. on the mat and um, roll. We've got a lot of guys who've got friends at other clubs. Um, come in, check out the facility, jump on the mat. You know, we love getting people from, from different clubs um, because as far as I'm concerned, we're one big family. Yeah. Um, and look, I get we have teams and when it comes to competition, we represent our team, but we're on the mat and training. We're family. Um, I've traveled around the world. I've trained at a whole bunch of different academies and every single one I've been to has made me feel like part of the family. And I like to um, return that not just to international, but to local uh, students as well. So our doors are open. So come down, come visit and always remember, it's good to be the king. <laughs> awesome. I couldn't have said it better myself. That's why you are the king, Elvis. Thank you so much. And ladies and gents, until next time, this is Rich signing off. But Behind the Black Belt. Behind the Black Belt is proud to support Veteran Grappling. Veteran Grappling is using the grappling arts to improve the lives of military veterans and first responders. Visit www.veterangrappling.com to learn about scholarship opportunities and more. Join our community on Facebook and our website at www.behindtheblackbelt.com. Behind the Black Belt is a TDP Studios production. Behind the Black Belt is copyright of Richard Thapthing Thong and TDP Studios. The music used in this episode is Rocking Forward by X Take Rux and is used under an Attribution International 4.0 license.